So I want to begin this just in the tradition that we have created here as what we know to be immortal beings, beings that do not perish, that our consciousness will exist forever. And we come in recognition of that with the universal symbol of touching and agreeing. And what this is, is this is us saying that, hey, I'm here, I'm in attendance, I'm with this total spectrum, this total vibration of all shapes, forms, sizes, fashions, frequencies, here at this moment in this time in agreement of unity and all of the power and all the growth that comes with that. It's also an opportunity that if any time in the future that you feel like, man, you know, it's really getting to me, I'm all alone, I'm by myself, nobody's vibing with me, you know, and you're not getting those things that you prefer, the glory, the honor, the riches, just remember this moment because that is here in abundance and it's here to share with you. And I do my best every time I come into this space to conduct this mantle, which is just something that is passed to you. It's something that does not belong to you. I'm a custodian of knowledge, wisdom, and experience here on the plane. I apply it to myself. And that's what's taken me so deep into myself to realize that everything and all is self. And our journey here is how long it takes us to figure that out. And within that process, I've actually searched quite a bit to be able to simplify, as I said, the journey. When I first came into just spirituality as a title, I felt like, okay, this is going to be it. I'm going to be studying spirituality all of my life. And true enough, it has been a lifetime of reading into a level of spirituality that I would say that comes from books all the way into going through personal experiences myself and being able to connect that with the knowledge that has come from those ancient books and texts. However, what I will say and what will be the vibration of today is it's not about having all of the knowledge. It's about having wisdom and the wisdom that is necessary for you right now that's going to be the most valuable to you right now. That also means that in the whole scope of this, the most important thing right now is you in the present, not necessarily you in the past, not necessarily you in the future. The one that's going to have the biggest impact on you is you in the present. And I come to the awareness that if you somehow don't like the world that you're in, then you're systematically saying that you don't like your mother. And that's because it's your mother that brought you into this world. So if you don't have respect for where you're at in life, that is the quest that you need to go on. If you're disappointed in yourself, if you're disgusted with yourself, if you don't feel that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm on alignment, I'm, 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 I'm making it happen, I'm doing my thing, you know, I feel totally comfortable with who I am, that's this quest that we're on. And once you reach that point, then you'll love your mother more than anything because you'll realize that you got a chance to go through this experience because of her. And so there are many that are disgruntled with their experience at this stage. So they hate their mother or any kind of energy around them that is motherly. And it is them also that this message is for because there is a destroy mission that is already deployed on this planet, meaning a self-destruct where you can experience a world that is rather callous, rather dark, rather dangerous, if you may. And there is a saying, and that saying goes, if you think this world is bad, wait until you get a load of some of the others. Meaning that in this experience, rather than us looking across dimensions, if we can only remember 150 years ago, where our great, great grandmothers and fathers experienced even a world that was embedded within war. And the frequency and the vibration of war is somewhat similar to the frequency and the vibration that many felt when the whole pandemic started launching. And then all this stuff was going crazy and the job was like, you got to stay home. And then the stock markets was crashing. And then there was this energy that was moving around and this energy brought everyone into this, this, this awakening in many ways. They got serious. It was now time to really get self together and figure out what self really even is. And so from time to time on the planet, we always have this wake up call, this alarm that goes off to wake us up. 
And I trust that with you awakening, even just one time, that you'll never sleep again, that you'll realize the power and the ability of all the things that you can do when you're constantly renewed. And as I said this evening, it's about that. It's about that constant renewal. It's about regeneration. It's about actually offloading many of the things that are causing you to age and onboarding the right kind of awareness that will allow you to begin to not only regenerate, but begin to expand into your, your true mission here and your true purpose in immortality. And as I was saying, when we were touching and connecting earlier, as adepts, we are aware that it does not end here. So whatever we need to do, we need to do it right now. Whatever we're going to experience, we need to experience it now. And while we're looking to, at times, this external idea of spiritual growth and connection that involves, I don't know, people were flying around the world on broomsticks playing Quidditch. Um, uh, I don't know, somebody throwing lightning from their hands at another person. Truly, the spiritual experience is personal. You could be going through one of the craziest portals inside of your mind and be sitting right next to somebody on the bus and they don't know what's going on beside the look on your face. And you can feel an infinite amount of energetic potential inside of your body, but even then someone right next to you may feel nothing because there's something about this experience that is attempting to teach us. And if we allow ourselves to become apt pupils, in this case, just a being that you would, as a master, give instruction to. If we allow ourselves to become that, then we'll receive our instruction. We'll receive our guides from within. So I asked first this question on this quest. Why do we even study? Somebody complimented my second camera the other day, so there it is. We're going to ride out a little bit. <laughs> why do we even study? What is this whole pursuit even of spiritual knowledge? Like I've been on this for 12 years personally in the public eye, but all my life I've been studying these books and looking through this knowledge. Why am I even doing that? Why are you even here on this show today? Like what is it even about this message that you're looking for? What do you expect to happen? So I had to to drill in with my own self, because that's, that's what this is about. It's about me coming to an awareness of myself. Give me one second here. So it's about me coming into awareness of myself, and it's about me coming into awareness of why I'm doing what, I, what I'm doing. So I had to ask myself, why are you studying all this stuff? What are you really looking to get out of all of this? Let's stop the mind. Let's stop tomorrow. Let's stop all these people. Let's stop everything that ever happened. Just center in with me real quick and let me know why are you doing this? And so I came up with two answers to myself right off. The first one was, is I want to know my origins. Just like back in the day where they would have like every single family member on the family and they would, this is your great grandfather, this is your great grandfather, this is your uncle, he did this. I wanted that. I wanted to know, you know, where were my people? Like, where, where did we come from? Like, what, what was our story? And right off when I started seeing the story of the consensus conflicting with the ancient knowledge, that's when I knew right away that I, I had a journey ahead of me. Because there was this moment when I went through the awakening where I realized that I had really been lied to, that the world and all of its proponents of knowledge that it claims to have omitted what I felt was the biggest thing, which was about the activation of the human body and the power and the potential. And from there, every single thing had to be under scrutiny. So I got the opportunity in the world, in this life, to let go of everything that I thought I believed in. Like the statement says, you've learned, now you must unlearn. And I went through the difficulties in the process of actually deprogramming dogmas and deprogramming mind control and deprogramming all these different things because I wanted to. I knew that it was necessary for me to, one, know my origins, that I needed to my origins were like at a distance. 
but there was no such thing as time. So, you know, since time creates space and then that's, that creates distance, but if there's no time, then there's no distance. So I felt like that my origins was really just probably something that was foggy, that I, I had too much in the way of my origins and I needed to work on that and clear that up. The second reason that I came up with of why do I study just right off, because, you know, it's good to ask yourself questions before you have an opportunity to think about it. <laughs> and the, one of the, uh, the second response was to discover this long lost hidden power. That there is, there's something about this awareness that comes to us that we have some type of spiritual powers and abilities that for us, it's probably going to make life more fun or make life more of an experience or give you a real insight to life. And in fact, many came on board into the awakening through just the awareness of having a third eye and a possibility of a third eye. It was just something everybody was talking about, like, man, I'm going to open my third eye. You remember that? Those times, man, I'm going to open my third eye. And, you know, that that became big because that's at the core of the essence of, of, of what we are on this quest for is like I'm on the quest also for my powers and my abilities. So even with those two things, just my origins, I want to know, you know, what, where my folks come from, how powerful was we? I just I, I, I need that story. I need to have that knowledge. Now, we're living in a time of an antithesis. So people will tell you you don't need that. <laughs> They'll tell you you don't need anything. And in many ways, they're, they're right. <laughs> it's a paradox that way. There's also that, that desire for an origin to know what we came through. Because they say, if you know what you came through, then you know who you are. And then when you know who you are, then you know the potential of what you can become. So that's what, I was, that's what I've been on the quest for. I wasn't saying that's what I was on the quest for, but I'm still on the quest. But today, I'm in a, such a clear state of consciousness, I can see through so many ideas of speculation. I call it speculative. They even have a term, they call it speculative Freemasonry. And I guess everybody that's in Freemasonry is, is, is speculative. And what this just means is, is that if we read a scripture, let's say it says, uh, you know, Allah made Adam from a kajil clot, okay? So now someone's got to come and begin to speculate on that. So they speculated. They said, yeah, that kajil clot or Adam is, is the red blood, you know, and then it may be the red blood in itself of Mars, Ma'adim. So they'll break this thing down. And start visualizing maybe Allah there, I don't know, with a huge bowl of congealed jello blood or whatever, and then forming and fashioning. And never realize that that's speculative. But you could see why, because that's like very romantic. You could see why that that became big, just to speculate, to have the ability to use the mind to, to do like a dream and to begin to create pictures around things. But then we realized that there was, a, there was an entirely different level of knowledge, an esoteric knowledge, if you may, a knowledge that said, let me show you that congealed clock. We're going to go into this laboratory. Let me pull this out of the freezer. Let me get a couple zygotes, shoot a couple formulas in here, give me some protein, throw this thing in the incubator. Now watch this. Two weeks later, you see something growing in there. Right, because that's not speculative. <laughs> that's the master's knowledge. And you have to realize that all throughout history, you're gonna always see those two things. So for those that wanna understand how today's show adhesed it all to the title, the two brotherhoods, the battle, the battle is the speculative and then the master. Now, you would think that this is no, batter, mat, no battle at all. <laughs> like, I mean, somebody that can really do something versus somebody that claims that they, that's, that they can do something is two totally different things. But no, we're living in the world where the speculative or those that just have an idea of what goes on actually get the most attention. While let's talk about our yoga masters. Let's talk about our masters of Tai Chi, Nai Gong. Like, you don't really, you know, you don't hear too much about them all the time. Right. So there is in a tense still even a conflict going on there between esoteric and exoteric. 
Now, obviously, one has the agenda to make sure that everyone that comes in contact with them or their system or their practices gains something. And in a certain sense, goes vertical versus there's clearly another system that is just like, hey, you're only here for me. And I'm just going to give you this knowledge and information, but it's not going to be something that you can actually apply and do something with. It's just speculation. It's just entertainment. So what you don't want to be in all of this, I can't tell you what you don't want to be. I'll tell you what you don't have to be. It's just entertainment. That there is a level of awareness and a level of knowledge and mastery that will mean the most to you because you will get a chance to use it for yourself. And since the most important thing is you in the present, that means that this becomes an extreme treasure to you. It's actually your protection. At the purest level, protection, which I call the professional technology, is just the wisdom and the awareness of exactly how to navigate the experience without shipwrecking yourself. So, this key to this long lost power, I first want to clean the slate for all of us and say, come into the space as if you're just beginning. That, yeah, you've been on a journey, but now this is what you came on the journey for. See, because like the journey itself, like, I don't know, the, the journey to spring break. <laughs> in the car with everybody, you know what I mean? Y'all probably didn't rent it something. It's like the journey to spring break is not like spring break. So this has been a pretty incredible journey. And all of us, we, we have to have the courage and the honor to always come back into the space every time we learn something and talk about what we unlearned, right? Not continue to go on with, the unlearning, that's like somebody who, you know, they know their craft is, is, is fallible, <laughs> does not work. And like some doctors, they've come into the awareness of the holistic path, but they're still, you know, practicing that same, you know, so they, they have the knowledge, but they're not applying it. So this application then has to come, it, it comes into this. It's, I just want this to be crystal clear for you today, because remember, this is a refreshment. This is the refresher. Realize then that more than likely the problem with this world, one of the big problems is it has too much knowledge. <laughs> like if I wanted to really know, have you ever Googled a dream symbol that you had? Like, you know, you dream of this, I don't know, I dream of a crocodile, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you hit Google with this, I dream of a crocodile, what does it mean? The first thing, big, big disasters and dangers are coming your way, right? Oh, no. You know, hopefully you don't have to go to work then. Hopefully you can keep Googling. So you keep Googling and you'll come up with the other one, which is your, the protectors are in your space and are around you, the ancient ones. You see what I mean? So it's like, okay, which one do I go with here? Because there's too much knowledge. So... Realize that, that it's not necessarily, as we're going to unveil even the metaphysical data set today, it's not about having all of the books. Having all of the books is equivalent to having Google. And then you go search all those books and you're going to get so many contradicting stories. You just need the, the books that all are connected to the original knowledge and only those books. Right? So the aspect of this that I'm coming at is, is first that the, the world actually has a lot of knowledge. And, and another thing is, which, which has become, you know, to its detriment. And another thing is teachers don't really have the time to learn. I say that again. Teachers don't really have the time to learn. Think about, especially in the Western culture, professor. Professor is already spending five days out of the week working with these kids. He's in stuck in the same traffic in LA that you may be stuck in. He gets home. He breathes the same air as you. He gets to eight o'clock, maybe gets a little dinner, maybe pops on his favorite show or podcast. He's back to sleep. He's back there again, or she's back there again, right? Then Saturday and Sunday come along and everybody wants their peace. <laughs> 
everybody's like, hey, you know, you're coming over to Auntie Brenda's tonight. Hey, let's go check out, I don't know, the Red Sox. Hey, I need help on this term paper. You're my uncle. Hey, you see what I mean? So when is this professor ever getting a chance to go beyond his or her profession? Right? So this is another phenomenon. So just with these two phenomena alone, one, there's a lot of now. So imagine even when this professor, he's finally like, I got to go further. I got can't teach second grade forever. I'm going to go study and become something new. He's going to get in the face of a million books. Since he has a professor, because you got access to all the, lot the libraries. And guess what? You don't need a million books. You just need the right books. And if it just so happens that they're like a needle in the haystack, ah, professor will never grow, really. Professor will peak. And as knowledge is always changing and wisdom and application is always changing, like the seasons, I mean, there's not one specific thing you need to know. It's one specific thing that you need to know now. So if it's as a farmer, if it's a certain season, all you need to know about is planting the crop for that season. That's what becomes most imperative for me. So as the season changes, even if you just have this one dimensional knowledge, if you may, the season may change into a dimension of knowledge that you don't have. And man, I saw this happen. I saw when even in my lifetime that epochs turned and the technologies and the forms of energy and the way of connection and all those things changed right before our eyes. And then there were some who could not make that change. And rather than how those of us with big hearts think that someone would be there to stabilize them until they went on to the great beyond, they just got left. Some of them got fired, downgraded. And I watched all of this go on like a child in the world, just like, wow, why does that happen? Wow, why did that happen? Trying to find an integer that would make me have the ability to not make it happen to me. So here's some, some knowledge for you. Here's some, some knowledge that is wisdom if you apply it. How this is set up is, let's just say there's two different directions. The further you go in one direction, which we'll say is that's toward the source. We won't even harp on the words right now. But the closer you get to the source of the projection, the clearer things get. Now, it turns out that that's actually inward. So it's not something you're going to, something that you got to go inside to get. But the closer you get, the more clear things come, become, and, and, and the more pure it becomes. The more refined are the abilities and the pleasures and the connections and all of that. Everything that you know to be stimulus and experience just becomes more refined. And that's why I said earlier, if you think this world is bad, wait until you get a load of some of the others, because there's also another direction. We call it the horizontal. That's why horror and, and horror has the same horizontal, right? So horizontal is a set of knowledge that is basically like, instead of going vertical where things are consistently purifying themselves, I don't care what shape it is, if it's a circle, if it's flat or whatever, I just know as I go into the higher parts of this, I get these more refined elements, argon, helium, et cetera, hydrogen, et cetera. So it means that if, I, if I'm ascending, if you may, then I'm gonna see more and more clearly. It's just a metaphor. Who cares what directions it is? it's in? It's a deep level of a metaphor with us. But if we go horizontally, then we'll keep going on and we'll begin to age. Things won't get more clear. They'll actually get more distorted. But you're going further and further. It'll feel like you're even dead, but you'll keep going. That's the path of the horizon. So, and this is also symbolically what the sun goes through every day. Symbolically also and physically what the body goes through every day. It dies daily. Thousands of billions of cells die out. It's over for them. Why new ones come into existence at every single moment. So I wanted to zoom in to just this awareness, though, that in a pure and unadulterated space, 
this would mean more than likely that your perception of everything that you think you want to know would be entirely different than it would be in a space that is suffering from some levels of distortion. Now, that's common sense. But I'm just saying that, is it possible that much of our perception about what can go on and what happens in, in the world is really controlled by dogmatic theories, theories of gods? What I say is, uh, okay, so what I'm, I'm just saying directly, because I want to be very clear here, I got notes. So is our perception of advanced consciousness shaped probably by other things that other people have been seeing and even other people were seeing that showed them? How much of this knowledge and wisdom and awareness do we actually have that's not speculative, that we can actually say this is exactly what went on, this is exactly what happened? Now. Again, if we got dogma and we got mind control, we will have some level of, uh, of tampering. But there is also, okay, so I, I want this to be very clear. Today, what I mean to express is, is that it's not that there aren't some very powerful things in existence and that there isn't a very mystical aspect to how we exist. I'm not here to refute that because I've gone through the experiences myself. What I am saying, though, is that what's generally, though, passed to people as experiences and what can be done and what should be done, especially on a spiritual level, have nothing to do with that. They generally have something to do with some type of dogma. But we know that the highest levels of occult knowledge, we know that chemistry, i.e. psychoactive substances, we know these kind of things actually produce different levels of results that are actually very tangible. So I'm saying chemistry, alchemy, and I'm saying psychoactive substance and certain levels of occult knowledge about symbolism, language, these kind of things have a real potent effect to them. But most of the knowledge that is actually being passed out has nothing to do with that. So the reason why we wanna to lay this path straight for our feet is that we got to realize that this is in real time, though. We're talking about us. I'm not talking about somebody else. I'm talking about Seven's experience in this. And then I trust that you'll be able to ask these questions to yourself and come to the same conclusions and be like, yeah, I think that honestly, especially after today, maybe we're just beginning. Because with this level of knowledge and this level of awareness, because it's very exact, it would equal an entirely different result. The distorted, unclear knowledge cannot get us to the highest levels of our, our experience. They, they're not, it's not possible for them. So when we move that out of the way, that's when we'll have it. So I also wanted to mention that, remember how I talked about how those worlds, they get worse. But I want to I want to make sure that it's very clear that the worlds, as we know, that there's a, a very deep connection between the word word and the word worlds. All you have to do is add an L. It's just the awareness that your mind is the world that you're living in. When your mind ceases to be connected to this world, it's like you're in a dream. You're in there now. That's where you are. Your mind is now focused on the dream, what you're calling the mind, the consciousness, whatever name you want to give it today. It's there. It's almost dead to this. So this means then if one is in a distorted world, or as I said, going horizontal, it's because the knowledge and the wisdom that they have is distorted. So very directly, what would happen when an L becomes an R? If you know that in Hebrew and in Arabic, the difference between the two dialects is an L and an R in their respective language. That's almost like the left hand and the right hand. They call it the double-edged sword. These swords or these words, right, have power, but there were two dialects. And so in these dialectical transfers, if like in Spanish, the V makes the B sound, 
right? So if, if even the names that you knew of your ancient country or your ancient heritage or your ancient ancestor, if the name had been changed, like instead of their name beginning with an R, it begins with an L now, or instead of it beginning with a B, it has a V or anywhere through that, what would happen to your consciousness? So this is sometimes looked over because sometimes language is not seen to be that powerful. And I was taken to a point of when I was a child when, just to show how powerful the mind is, I always remember when I would get hurt, like I would fall or something like that. It would happen and then I would wait for the rush of the pain. So like, let's say I slam my finger in the door, I would see my finger get slammed in the door and I wouldn't feel anything at first, but then I'd be waiting, like here it comes, the rush of the pain. So it was almost like my mind was telling me that there was gonna be pain for me to feel it. Now, as you get older, it becomes natural. You hit yourself and your pain right away. But of course, those who really train and really practice know that the pain comes from the mind saying that, hey, you're, you just slam your finger in the door, no matter what condition the finger is actually in. So it's an awareness, again, that if you have control of your mind, it would really mean that you actually had control of the language and you had control of the words and that the order of the language and the words that are in your mind would be in the right order. I've always mentioned this as if anyone needs hope is to remember that what has really gone on here on the planet and what can really get you to a greater stage within yourself can be articulated to you in English. So English is still a good enough language to where it can be articulated to you. English consists of 26 letters, A to Z. Now you already know the 26 letters, you know A to Z. What you would just be missing then is the order of those words. Because the, those words or letters, excuse me, put in the right order will explain to you every single thing that ever happened here, everything that you need to know. So it's that close is what I'm saying. You have the tools that are necessary to know everything. They're that close. But what you need is the order. And the order of things becomes so important. I always say that it's very similar to the gestation process of a mother that is birthing the child. The child is developing certain things in a specific order. So for those who don't like order, what happens if your heart develops before something else? So there's an extreme order going on and whether the re rebel wants to have that order or not, the rebel will just stay immature. The mature beings, they know the order because they know nothing can come against the order. As long as you are, are, are modeling everything after the order and how it all works, you never meet disappointment. So that's what I was saying. It was, about the, it was about the balanced knowledge because if you could get this knowledge, you would never find any disappointment. You would see people all around you having a bad time. Just like, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a part, I believe it's in Revelation, but it comes out of another book. It says that the kingdom of heaven will come, but people won't see it. It will actually be here. Almost like it's overlaying the reality that everybody else is in and everybody else would appear to be in the same reality, but some people will already be in heaven. So they say the kingdom of heaven will be amongst you or around you, but you may not be able to see it because it's actually something that you experience. It's not something that you, you want to see. It's something that you want to experience. So when you get into your mind and you put things in order, then you'll have the potential to experience it because I always tell myself this, listen, if you're not continuously progressing, you can't keep going on like this. You need to get more and more refined and clearer and clearer. And until that happens, anytime you ask yourself, what should I be doing? The answer should be that. That's going to be the biggest thing for you. That's going to make the most impact. But for those who really are able to succeed in this, it will be because they pretty much did it themselves. It won't be because it means that they would have worked hard for it. Why? Because they would have balanced out. If you're going to work hard, it's going to work hard for you. If you're not going to work at all, then it's not going to work for you. And that's how the whole thing is. It's literally a reflector. And 
Of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's a speculative and the speculative makes you think that it works for those who don't really take time with it and really try. So this is the encouragement today of why you should stay persistent on this process of coming into awareness of exact knowledge. And most importantly, about your origins and about your power. So now, as you know, this is a part of the Sovereignty Series. And I felt that the most important thing was, because when you're dealing with sovereignty, first of all, you, need to, you have to know what sovereignty really means. It probably doesn't mean exactly what you think. So it's important to know that would be the difference, because now it's become a buzzword. People say, sovereignty, sovereignty, we need our sovereignty. And it's just like, it's just becoming the word. So we started to define what sovereignty is, but we need to basically make sure that we're putting this into the proper perspective once more if we're gonna continue on this sovereign build. And it's one that when you really boil everything down around this word, what it has most to do with, especially in ancient times, was about protection. A sovereign actually meant someone that was responsible for taking care of others and everyone else, a whole village, a whole tribe, a family. And so more importantly and very specifically, it was actually that they could protect, again, they could protect everybody and keep everybody safe. So I mentioned earlier that the purest level of protection is wisdom because you know certain things that allows you to navigate through the space for you and those that choose to have you responsible for them. And you're always ahead of the curve. Something be taking place and you're only benefiting off of it because you already know what's gonna happen. You already know the algorithm. That's a sovereign. So we have to think then that there would be then two different types of protection. There would be this external protection, right? Well, so first we mentioned the internal protection. The internal protection is having this wisdom. Even in a family, if we want to make this very basic, in a family that is very close-knit, there's a, there's a skill. There's a, a trade. What we call a, a, I always forget the word every single time, but it's a, a, the skill or the trade that the family knows. They call it trade secrets. There it is again. Trade secrets, something that you can do, whether you can dye fabric, whether you can grow corn, there's something that your family can do that creates the value within your family that allows you to come to the farm with everybody else, because that's also where the, the sovereigns are. They, you get a chance to sit at the table with everybody else, like, okay, well, I, I grow this and I grow that. Let's make an exchange here. So very directly, there is that internal, so you're working on yourself, you're developing something, and then that comes to the betterment of everyone because it's actually at the same level, at least, of what everybody else is producing. That's actually what a sovereign is really about. So we're going to get into that a little bit more here in a moment, but there's the external one, and the external one just has to do with killing everybody. It has to do with who is the most strongest and the most threatening. You got to realize that the other level of protection, if it's not going to be wisdom, if it's not going to be staying ahead, that's why you really only have two choices here. Some people always say, well, Seven, I need to understand how to protect myself, right? And the external one is definitely the bum route. Like the entire history of humanity is mostly full of the external applications of protection, which, into, which end up in warfare. So it's this internal application that we're looking for. So this professional technology then is the secrets of getting to the perfected states and the instructions on the journey very directly. Some will travel lateral, basically some will travel horizontal and not vertical as we explained before. They will go on further in their journey collecting lots of wisdom, lots of knowledge if you may, but never really applying it. They will grow old, and they will never see the benefits of what it is themselves, what it is itself, because they were speculating. While there are others that will go vertical, they will crystallize the knowledge, 
they will refine themselves with that knowledge, meaning that they'll actually apply that knowledge to themselves. And it would be as to them, as if things were getting clearer and clearer, as if they were drawing closer and closer to something that was the ultimate. So these are the benchmarks. So here's a recap, because here's where we're going to begin this evening. It's just a brief recap on our first sovereign presentation here on, on YouTube. There was one an awareness that in this sovereign field, because we're, we're dealing in something that is, is really undefined, it has to become defined. There must be some type of measurement. So very specifically, we talked about that in, well, first, I'll have to do this in order. First, we talked about that your mind is sovereign is in a sovereign trust, that this mind that you have is actually a co-creative conscious mind. It has an extremely high value. And let's say the creators of the mind, if you may, decided that it could not be owned by anyone. So it is in a trust. So even if you get tricked into believing that something can own your mind, it would be a trick indeed. And you can go on with that until you wake up out of the trick. And then just like that, you can be released from the trick. So if something is saying, well, I have you, I owned you, you did this ritual, you did all of this. That's the, that's the jokers, if you may, trying to convince your mind that they have you. But none of that can be the case because we've discovered inequivocally that the mind in itself does not belong to anything. So that's why the term is, if you free your mind, then the rest will follow. That's why wherever you think you're at, that's where you're at. When you're having a great time in your mind, you're having a great time. When you're having a horrible time, it's all gotta be processed through the mind. And there's a reason for this because your mind is basically the ultimate control point of the whole thing. You can always retreat to your mind. And so if you know how to control your mind, then you can always be in a pleasant vista no matter what's going on around you. Now, of course, there's a million excuses behind that or why some person is not in the best state of mind, but it's for the record that it's because the mind actually is, belongs to no one. So we went on and even coming from the mind, since let's say if that's an, some type of origin point, we know there's still a physicality. So the physicality comes into play. And when the physicality comes into play, because it's manifested from the mind, in order for someone to even say that they own the physicality, they have to go through this entire process. And we elaborated on that in our last Sovereign Build. And that process was also taking measurements even creating, actually, personally, first, creating a unique measurement system, a measurement system that is unique to you and the nation of your people, because the measurement system has every single thing to do with the energy and the power that is being evoked. So we see right now in the world, we have the royal cubic system, right? This is the system that was used in, in Kemet, or what you're calling Egypt. They also use the digit then. So if you're thinking that technology is new, think again. They were using what's called digits. And that word actually means grain. It actually also refers to your fingers because you plant seeds, you create things. And this digit is the digital side of the reality. It's the ability to create things in a reality that actually in itself is quantum. It's only solid because the mind agrees that it's solid. That's why when you take any substance and the mind stops focusing on the solidity of this reality, it stops becoming solid. When you go to sleep, the reality goes, all, the, all together goes away and you're put into another reality. So again, these things seem very basic, but they are that renewal and that confirmation like check. Okay, we good with that, check. <laughs> Now we understand this, the mind is a sovereign property. You're just working to get control of this. If you can get control of this, then you got everything. Some people say, well, that sounds so easy. Try not to think for one minute. 
<laughs> and see how easy it is. And then you'll realize, Samson, the Philistines are upon you, meaning that you have giants in your mind at this point, big ideas constantly bothering you and telling you, you know, who you are, or who you're not, what you're supposed to become. Right. So being able to steal your mind, literally make it steal, stop it, is the power. So what we're talking about is the process of getting to that power. And then we're talking about even when you get to the power, how is the world that is already created before you realize your power? How is it here? It's here because when you have an object with which all of our ancestors created that measures the sun, it is thus measuring the time and thus the device itself becomes the object that is able to record space and time. So those sundials, those megaliths that actually measure the seasons, that's the only thing that our ancestors needed to make as above, so below. And so they would bring this measurement of space time right into the place that they were in, in the nation that they were in. And that is how a world is developed. And that's no different from, you know, because you'll see the continuous thing roll out again. They always say it's holographic. Yeah, because you'll see the same thing rolling out again. You'll always get someone going somewhere, bringing their family, staking a claim, building a house, building a clock of some type. It's like some people, okay, listen. Some people think that clocks are to measure time, like the original use of a sundial, like they, they're measuring the seasons. It's like, think about how silly that is. We never think about just how silly that may be, that you got this big thing that you've built and its whole goal is to tell you something that you already know. Like you're looking right at the stars, so they were acquainted with the stars, so they already knew when spring, summer, fall, all that was going to come around. So this thing is not to measure what time of the day it is. It's to actually dial in the entire space time. And once the entire space time is, is put into place, that's why I answered they use this qubit. Then they start messing with these sixes, right? Because there's that that's the function dating component, six is sex. And then they start regenerating these realities and begin to build them. Like you got all these trees all over the place. The, many of these trees are the same. You got different trees, you got seeds, you got. So you have basically a cog that is now connected with the clock of the universe, right? And so that's what these things are used for. So it's just, it's that awareness that, well, to be exact, to be a master, these are the things that are applied. And then once they're applied, then you get a chance to experience the results because the results are a part of the order. In the mind first, then we come through, we dial in space time. We, cr we create a measurement system because in the space that you're in, in the foundations that you're in, the only one that can be given credit for creation is the creators. So this means that anybody coming after that cannot stake claim to something that is already created. So as we see in the Salian law, which is assault priesthood, is that they measure above and below in the air, in the sky, and they take claim over those spaces. They make a map because everyone must agree on what it looks like. Where is it? Where are you? I'm right here on the map. Where? At 455.25, whatever latitude, and at this, this, this longitude, this amount of miles away from this milestone. You see what I mean? So there's a, there's a dialing in that's happening, and that's the dialing in that we're all agreeing to, and that agreement is based on measurements, my act. So we got the metric system, right? So Because remember now, it doesn't mean that there's just one system. That lets us understand a lot about how earth has been unfolding. Someone can create a system and then someone else will say, well, I want my own system. I'm about to dial in my own space and time. So those that want to develop the matrix, they develop the metric system. That's what the matrix is built on is the metric system and all of those numbers. Those who wanted to build an imperial, right? And you know who they are, the aristocratic imperial system. So they just, here's our measurements. <laughs> Their measurements be so far off. Like if you ever use a millimeter versus a, uh, versus an inch, it's just like, man, where, where are we at here? How can I be even exact here? Just a rush to create a system that is unique to them so they can try to dial in space time before they even know what else to do after that. And this sometimes even seems like our pursuits, you know, it's like, I'm going to blast off to this other planet. It's like, what are you going to do when you get there? I don't know. <laughs> 
It's like, you, we got to dial into this a little bit more. So our ancestors were very, very precise. And then finally, some of the oldest systems, which are the customary systems. So at this stage then, since it's that vast, so we just recapping on last week, the mind and the measurements is how space-time is dialed in. So if we're not going to be talking about that and we're not going to be diving into that, then we need to be doing something that is going to get us there, get us to that ability of how to even state claim over your own space, whether it's your bedroom, whether it's this property that you buy. That's why they're showing you they got this thing. It's like a joke now. You can become a lord or a lady. You know, you can order it online. <laughs> and according to the laws, all you need to own is like a plot of land like this thick over in Britain somewhere and then file also the rest of the paperwork. And now you're officially a lord and a lady. So there, there, are, there are things that you can do that are still stand to this day about how you claim your space or how you claim your, 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 your rights, if you may, because that's the ritual. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about, you know, these rituals that Earth has going on and what they're actually doing, because it is also when you're trying to dial into something that happened 500,000 years ago, you need to set the dials perfectly. And that's what a ritual is. It's like dialing in the energy of that space. There's a certain smell, there's a certain time. And it's like, let's, let's move all these integers around that control space and time so that we can recreate 5,000 years ago right now. 